if we could start a movement where not only ourselves, but create a community across the whole industry of bringing people together so we could help newbies and uh, those that were veterans within, within the industry would be able to share their experience and feedback in a way where there was no commercial intent, yeah. that could be a wonderful and pure thing. When developing a go-to-market strategy, today's Ask an Expert says you need to be focused and have a component built around building trust and being genuine. Hi, I'm Joshua Carlson, co-founder of Propeller Media, and today I sit down with Mark Graham. Mark is the co-founder and chief brand officer of CommonSkew. It's a platform and service that's completely upended the way the promotional products industry works today. Mark is going to talk about the importance of focusing on what real problems are in the marketplace before you try to develop solutions. He's also going to talk about why the promotional products industry needs to be more focused on providing strategy to the products that they provide their clients. And finally, he's going to talk about how he's built a big following by providing rich educational content across multiple formats. If you like today's episode, please hit the like button. Subscribe so you can be informed when the next episode drops. Now let's hear what Mark has to say. Mark, thank you so much for coming on our Ask an Expert show. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me, Joshua. So I want to jump in and I want to just kind of lead into this with my personal experience. Um, having been in the marketing space for 15 years, kind of dip my toes into the promotional product space a couple of times, both as a consumer and somebody looking to maybe actually resell it. Um, it's kind of a disjointed ecosystem. And I believe that's in large part what you experienced as well when you founded your company, CommonSkew, uh, about a decade ago. So I wanted to just kind of hear the genesis. You were in the space. You were, you were not toe deep. You were, you were neck deep in it. Um, what specifically were you seeing and how did CommonSkew, what was the kind of design to, to solve for that? Well, I, I might actually go back uh, 20 years, not just 10 years, because I can then give you the real foundation of it. So I actually started in the promotional products industry, not as a software person. Yeah. I started off as a promotional products distributor. So yeah. uh, I had a company called Right Sleeve. It was founded in 2000. Uh, out of Toronto, which is where I'm from, you'll get the accent over the course of the uh, <laughs> course of the interview. And uh, Right Sleeve was set up as a promotional products design agency. And I loved that business, I ran that business for the better part of 20 years. We sold it last year. But the reason I give you that context is that I had experienced firsthand, or I was up to my neck, as you say, yeah. in the day-to-day -day minutia of running a promotional products business. And you might say, well, what's that minutia? It's the putting together presentations, putting together quotes, dealing with salesperson commissions, dealing with uh, presentations to customers and orders and purchase orders and all of this uh, stuff uh, that isn't necessarily rocket science, but when you put it all together, it becomes very, very distracting for a right. growing promotional products company. And that problem, the one that we had experienced firsthand is what led to the building of Common Skew. Okay. Um, so throughout this journey, this early journey, say, you know, 15, 20 years ago, as I was building right sleeve, I was experiencing firsthand the inefficiencies of right. growing a promotional products company and managing all these different forms and interactions with customers and suppliers. And so we actually built our own software system. We said, how hard could this be? There wasn't anything else out in the market that satisfied our needs. And so we said, let's go build our own system. Um, that's always famous last words for anyone who <laughs> thinks that they can build software easily. Sure. Uh, anyways, so we ended up building it piece by piece as an internal project solution. And uh, once we built that, we, we realized it was an incredibly strong and powerful solution that other people like Right Sleeve would be able to use as well. And that's when we decided in around 2010, 10 years ago, as you said, mm -hmm. uh, to go and commercialize that and spin it off as a separate company. Okay. And so in 10 short years, um, and I'm sure they felt like long years to you, but in 10 yes. short years, uh, you guys are facilitating almost a billion dollars in annual revenue. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to talk about kind of the beginning. You guys started with a great product and you knew that because you were using it, which yes. obviously is a great, you know, perfect beta tester, but what was kind of your growth strategy coming out of the gates as a startup with a brand new product? What was the strategy to get out into the marketplace and start capturing market share? There, there were two things that we started off out of the gate. And, and I should say at the beginning that we were 
100% bootstrapped. So this was our own money that we'd put into this. We didn't go out and raise lots of uh, venture capital money. Uh, we were fortunate to have had another business that was allowing us to bankroll sure. this side project at the time. Yep. So, so there were two things that we leaned on heavily um, because the economics were attractive. Number one was word of mouth and our uh, reputation and our relationships inside the industry. So since we'd had 10 years up until this point, uh, my reputation, my business partner's reputation, who's also my partner in life, Catherine, um, we had um, fairly uh, uh, strong reputations as just being people that had been active in the industry for that, for that period of time. So we were sure. able to lean into word of mouth and our relationships. And then the other is the power of community. Uh, we'd actually launched Common Skew as a social platform right at the very beginning where we were able to bring in uh, industry professionals who would be able to connect and collaborate with each other. And it was a very organic offering that we put together, but ended up becoming a very powerful part of the software in terms of how it connected people across the supply chain. So okay. distributors, suppliers that could all come together and interact and work on, on um, business opportunities together. Sure. And that was a wonderful organic and I think a very authentic way for us to build connections and also to build credibility and to build trust. Right. Um, that was a very, very powerful thing that we did that didn't cost a lot of money. And even, even if we had tons of money, I don't think that we could have bought trust. Yeah. We, had to, we had to be authentic. We had to prove ourselves to people and we had to demonstrate that we were the real deal. And this was a very powerful way of doing that. Okay. Um, I'm curious, just from a cultural standpoint, how pivotal was that to grow the business? Um, having a, some sort of foundation in a culture that is important to you, your business partner, and the team that you have. In terms of how, how important culture is? Yeah, to, to stay true to it, because I think a lot of businesses get an idea, and it's a great idea, and they're off and running, but because yep. they don't have this foundation in what their company is really about, they can go off the rails rather quickly. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a great question. Uh, so for us, uh, establishing that trust and that culture of authenticity as, as a software company was absolutely paramount. And the reason being is that we're selling a system of record to a promotional products distributor to, that allows them to run every single aspect of their business. And if you're a promotional products company and you're making an investment in a, a piece of software like this, you're not going to go and make that investment if the software company is run by people that are seen as untrustworthy right. or are, aren't authentic or haven't built something that um, communicates uh, security or value um, because it's an absolutely essential part of the business. So for us to, 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 uh, to skip that in the building of common SKU would have sunk us. Um, so as a result, it was really important for us to establish that foundation of authenticity, of culture, of transparency. Um, and I think that the other benefit that we had, although maybe at times it, it, it was a challenge, but I think mostly it was a benefit, is that Catherine and I had been in the promotional products industry for the better part of a decade up until that point. Right. And the reason that was mostly a benefit is that we were able to say, we have walked 10 years literally in your shoes. We understand yeah. exactly what it's like to be a distributor, to understand the highs and the lows. Mm -hmm. And as a result, that, that was able to, um, I think, earn a fair amount of trust with the customer base. The reason I say it was a bit of a drawback is that some customers in the early days said, well, hang on a second here. You run a competing company on the other side of the, of the fence, so to speak. Right. And uh, there's no way we're gonna go with you because you're gonna steal all of our data. And we actually enjoyed having those conversations because it allowed us to really lean into this whole idea of trustworthiness and yeah, authenticity right. and us to tell the story as to, um, as, as to how the business was actually set up. It was a wonderful opportunity for us to overcome objections in, I think, a very trustworthy way. Okay. Well, that's interesting. And I'm, I'm glad to hear you say came with both sides of the coin, but oh, the negative side came with the opportunity to really explain and almost validate this, this trust platform that you're talking about. Yep. So let's talk about just the industry as a whole, because right now you kind of, you've transitioned from being more on the product side to now you're this facilitator that's allowing, you know, manufacturers and distributors yep. to work together more efficiently. What have the past several months been like for the industry as a whole as we've all gone through just an incredible amount of disruption this year? 
it has been uh, to say it's been a roller coaster ride would be an understatement, uh, and I think that many of us in the business community would would feel the same way. Um, so, if I, if I take you through it quickly chronologically, I would say that March and April were terrifying. I've been in business yeah. for twenty years, and there were moments that Catherine and I would wake up and go are we going to have a promotional products industry? And if we don't have a promotional products industry, that's <laughs> yeah, going to be yeah. really <laughs> difficult for, for common skew. Um, and, and I wouldn't say literally did we wake up thinking that, but there were some days where we were just thinking, sure. th there are so many aspects of our business that are th under threat right now, like with yeah. conferences being canceled, events being canceled, companies uh, laying people off left, right, and center, marketing budgets are usually the first one to get cut. And within a marketing budget, usually the promotional products budget within that larger marketing budget is usually the first one to get cut. So we were seeing people getting furloughed, getting fired, high profile events like South by Southwest, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, were being canceled. And they're huge promotional products buyers, sure. uh, conferences like that. So that was terrifying. March and April were terrifying. And I think that we collectively as an industry steeled ourselves for some really rough times ahead. Okay. And what was fascinating is that by stealing ourselves for these tough times ahead, the industry really came together mm. in a way that I have never seen the industry come together in my 20 years in this business. Right. Um, from a, how can we help each other? How can we be creative? How can we sell in a strategic way that allows our industry to elevate itself in the eyes of the customer? Sure. And what's interesting is that since March and April, up until now, we're recording this at the end of November, um, the industry has really rebounded considerably. Okay. Now, I couch that by saying, I'm not suggesting the industry has doubled in size and yeah. it's the go-go days of, say, two years ago. We're still in, in some challenging times, but the industry has rebounded quite a bit from that trough that we saw in March and April. Sure. And, and that's a real testament to the people who are in this industry that are coming together and are solving client problems. And by shifting the clients away from well, what do you do when your event is canceled? Now people are doing these incredible virtual at-home drop kits. Yeah. And that's delighting customers and end clients in a way that has probably never happened in our industry. Yeah. And, and so when you're dealt, uh, what's the, what's the, the, uh, the phrase when you're, when you're given lemons, you make lemonade, make lemonade. right? As opposed yeah, to, right. you know, crying over spilled milk. Um, so I'm very optimistic um, that, our industry, uh, the worst is behind us, and that okay. we're uh, we're turning a corner. It's going to be some time until we return to the good old days, sure. shall we say, in terms of sales numbers. But I see us definitely on the path. Okay, um, I want to talk about products themselves. Yep. Um, so I had a guest on um, John Rulin talks about giftology and the yep. um, the value of giving an artifact. Um, very much different than at least the traditional perception of promotional products. Right. Um, and this is followed by uh, a future guest, and we're going to talk about SKUCon a little yeah. bit later on, but one of your speakers there um, really kind of rocked the industry. Um, and so senior writer with uh, Fast Company, um, and I want to read it accurately here. It's, uh, it's time to stop spending billions on cheap conference giveaways. Um, Let's talk about that concept and let's talk yeah. about the evolution of the product itself. <laughs> so I've been to hundreds of conferences. So I have more than, you know, carried in my luggage, uh, copious amounts of swag. Um, yeah. But a lot of it has just quickly eroded. Yeah. Um, and so I want to talk about what you see as the evolution of the promotional product itself. Well, I'll say to you before I answer that question, the fact that you had the promotional product in your bag coming back suggests that it wasn't half bad because sure. if it's really bad, you know where it's going, either yes. the trash can or in your hotel room <laughs> hotel and room, yeah, right. <laughs> you're, you're just leaving it. And, and, that, and that's, a, that's a sad commentary on a part of the promotional products industry. Sure. To say it's the entire industry, absolutely not. To say it's a part of the industry, I regretfully say that I, I, think, it's a, I, I think that that's true. Um, so you mentioned uh, the uh, Elizabeth Segrin, who's yep. the staff company, or sorry, staff writer at Fast Company, who wrote this article. I I think it was about two or three years ago, but it was it was this this article that dropped, and the entire promotional products industry just lost its lunch, so right. to speak. If you can just imagine that, I um, very much can. And and because this isn't some 
two bit blogger who's writing about yeah. their experience with promotional products. Like who cares about that two bit blogger if there's three people who read it? This is Fast Company, one of the most preeminent business publications that's read by marketers all around the world. Yeah. And this is someone who is saying promotional products are trash. They should not be allowed or, or you should just, you, you shouldn't purchase them. Um, and, and what was interesting about it at the time is that when I read it, there was a part of me that was upset. I was defensive. I've been in this industry. I love this industry for the better part of 20 years by that point. And I was like, how dare this person write about the, the promotional products industry this way? She's got it wrong. Yeah. But then I took a step back and I counted it to 10 and I was like, you know what? She's, she's about half right. And I'll give her that. The other half, she's not right. And what was interesting is that we actually, when I say we, um, I have an, a, another one of our executives at Common Skew named Bobby Lee, who, who heads up all of our content. We decided to reach out to Elizabeth and invite her onto our podcast called the Skewcast. This was about yeah. two, three years ago. And we thought there is no way this fancy writer from Fast Company is gonna to respond to these two promotional products guys uh, <laughs> to go on the podcast to get roasted right, right. Uh, by, 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 uh, by these two people. And so we approached her in a very constructive way and said, we'd love to have this conversation with you about where you're absolutely right and about where there are some opportunities for our industry to improve, as well as let's highlight some of the stories and some of the, some of the areas that this industry uh, may completely surprise you. Sure. And we had a wonderful conversation with her, built a great relationship with her. And then now we've invited her to speak at SKUCon, yeah. which is our event in January, which he just mentioned. And so th this is just an interesting way, I think, of, of framing the promotional products industry that mm -hmm. a lot of people see it as cheap swag and as tchotchkes that get thrown yeah. out. But at the same time, think about all the products that are in your house or in your office right now. I'm sure that we could probably take a tour of your office right now and see some products that you've kept that have meant so much to you, that have been branded with a company whose brand you appreciate, that a product has been produced with love and care, and you use it continuously. That's the power of our medium. Right. And the problem is, is that not every marketer in our industry sells products that necessarily match the client's objective. Sometimes right. it's, I need 200 or something in two days. My budget is $2. What can you get me? Yeah. That usually goes straight into the trash can, which is a problem as right. opposed to thinking about it more strategically with, as I say, some more love and care and intent. Uh, well, so I'm going to name drop. We have a, a Mondays with Nick. Uh, Tumblr. Yes. So uh, a fellow, fellow friend in the industry, um, that is something that I do use every day. Um, and that is something that from a product standpoint, it has a utility that is of extreme value for me. Yes. So his brand is staying there on my desk every day. Um, but it is interesting. And so I'm curious on your philosophy on how you might mentor companies and businesses. Do you tell them, hey, it would be better rather than getting a thousand of X Yes. Of getting 100 of why because these will be so much more meaningful and will have a longer shelf life which will execute this long-term brand resonance that you're going for yes I, I, absolutely i i think that what i would also include in there joshua is that it's really really important that a promotional products distributor understands the goals mm. and objectives of the market yeah, right in some cases the ideal product may be something that is uh, higher in volume, lower in quality and lower in price. In right. some cases, that may be the absolute winning formula. Um, in other cases, you're right, it's, 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 it's sometimes better to say dial uh, down the quantity and up the quality so that way the marketer is getting more bang for their buck because more of those 100 items are actually gonna be kept as opposed to sure. being thrown away. Um, so I think my general comment there, and I think that this is where we have an opportunity in the promotional industry, mm -hmm. is that there's a, there's a bit of a divide between what we call the order taker, okay. uh, maybe derogatively, you might call them a trunk slammer, right? Just someone who says, hey, you want a product? I can get you a product. Yeah. Let me know what you want. Take a look at my website or take a look at my catalog and I'll get you a good price. Right. Um, that, that is generally what we call a non-strategic order taker. Sure. And 
generally products that come from people like that aren't necessarily strategic or tied to a specific marketing objective. Yeah. Um, the other side of the industry are people who are more agency oriented, more marketing uh, uh, driven, where they'll sit down with their customer and say, well, what are you trying to what are you trying to do here? What, mm -hmm. what, what, what does success look like from this marketing investment? Right. And how can we help you make that very successful? And it may not be a thousand white t-shirts. It may in fact be a hundred Nike polos because the audience say is a little bit more refined. And some of the, it's not rocket science, but I think sometimes asking these questions allows the customer to really think about what they're trying to achieve with this sure. marketing budget. And, and I think that's a tremendous opportunity for our industry. Well, I'm glad you used the word strategy, right? And to actually say, hey, what is, what is the campaign? What is the objective that you're going towards? Because I yeah. do feel, and again, I'm, I'm largely an outsider, so I, I kind of speak off the cuff a little bit. But yeah. um, having been to uh, hundreds of conferences, I do feel there's a lot of organizations that are like, hey, I just want my logo on something, right? Yes. And they don't think about the long term. And that's where, you know, as you talk about budgets getting squeezed this year, and typically promotion products being at the top, yeah. I might argue that there's a reason that it shouldn't be the top one. You're just misspending it, so you're yes. not seeing the results that you want, but if you were more strategic with it, you could actually see more long-term. Because promotional products are just one channel yes. to an overall objective. Yes. It's, not a, it's not a direct you know, marketing tool. It is a part of a what should be you know, an omni or multi-channel strategy to get the results you're looking for. I, 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 hundred percent. And I think that's an excellent point that you just made, made there that promotion products are just one of several channels. And I think that right. the very best promotional products campaigns probably come out of the same companies that produce the very best overall media campaigns, right. the very best television, the very best print ads, the very best social media ads. And the reason being is that you have this incredible partnership between the agency that's providing the media, whether it's yep. the ad agency writing the copy for a great Super Bowl ad, sure. all the way down to say the promotional products industry where you've got a great agency oriented company that sits down with a great inspired marketer yeah. that has a vision and is excited about talking about things like ROI and, and cares about their brand. Yeah. When you bring those two things together, I think back at my most favorite and successful campaigns that I ever did as a distributor. And it was always with a marketer that cared about their brand. Right. When it was someone who was just like, I don't care. I just have another thousand dollars that I need to spend on something for my trade show in two days. Yeah. I don't know that I was terribly proud of taking those orders, but I don't know that they would have necessarily been the most talked about items. And, sure. and as the business grew, I moved way away from that transactional stuff and more yeah. into the strategic uh, opportunities just because they had a much bigger impact and, and gave our firm a much stronger reputation. Okay. Um, well, I want to shift gears a little bit. We've uh, recently incorporated a little quick fire round. So I've got some, okay. uh, some quick fire questions. I'm going to hit at you. Uh, favorite podcast you're listening to right now? Um, can't, be, reply. can't be your own. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, Reply all. Okay. All right. That's a good one. I've listened to that. Um, who is your personal source of professional inspiration, whether living or somebody that's from the past that you look up to is really like, hey, this is somebody that inspires me to be better? Seth Godin. Okay. We'll talk about him in a minute. Um, favorite book that you have either read or are reading right now that you think is topical? I was asked this the other day and, and I was, I wanted to give a, a fiction business book, but I was struggling to give one recently. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give Les Miserables, which is, uh, which is a, a huge classic <laughs> fiction book that I read over the quarantine okay. and absolutely blew me away. It was just absolutely wonderful. So I'd recommend everyone read it and just get through it. Okay. Uh, well, quarantine is certainly good for consuming like lots of pages. Um, yeah. All right, early riser or burning the midnight oil? Early riser, get okay. up usually around five. Okay, you yeah. and me together. Uh, and then finally, uh, favorite topping for pizza? Um, green pepper. Green pepper, okay, it's a good one. Um, all right, now let's shift. I wanna get back into what is something that I have really personally um, become passionate about in the past six, seven months, which is content. Um, yep. Not only individually, but I love talking to entrepreneurs and business owners about how they've leveraged content. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is at the same time that you were launching 
um, your, your business, you decide to do Promo Kitchen so that you have an educational platform that's based on educating and mentorship. And there's no coincidence here. You obviously had a strategy. So I'd like to hear, and I think you talked about it a little bit earlier, establishing trust and, you know, defining value. Yeah. Um, but I want to go back and really just from the strategy side of, hey, hey, we're going to put a content platform out there. What was that like back at the time? So Promo Kitchen is a non profit, all volunteer community that I was one part of helping set up uh, a okay. better part of about 10 years ago. And it was set up by, uh, we, we call ourselves a sort of a self-described, uh, the geeks and nerds of the industry sure. that were really interested in um, advancing independent education and mentorship within the industry. We didn't want to have any commercial elements to it. Yeah. We wanted to all come together just because we uh, loved um, working with each other and just really loved the industry and, and thought there was an opportunity for something that was independent mm -hmm. that wasn't part of our day jobs. Um, so how could we indulge our curiosities sure. as people who are in the industry to um, advance education, to start conversations, to address some challenging topics in the industry, again, without being beholden to, to commercial interests. Right. Um, and, and, and do it because it just felt like it was the right thing to do. I think we were also motivated because a number of us had been in the industry for about 10, 15 years up until that point okay. that we were reflecting on our beginnings in the promotional products industry. Mm -hmm. and a lot of us were united in this, in this reality that we didn't really have great mentors or great advisors or really okay. people that were there to help show us the way. Yeah. Um, and that's not a, that's not a criticism of the industry. It just was just at a different stage at that point. Right. And so we thought, if we could start a movement where not only ourselves, but create a community across the whole industry of bringing people together so we could help newbies and uh, those that were yeah. veterans within, within the industry would be able to share their experience and feedback in a way where there was no commercial intent, yeah. that could be a wonderful and pure thing. Um, and amazingly, Promo Kitchen still exists. It's bigger better, healthier, and more vibrant than it was when we set it up 10 years ago. Yep. And I'm honored to still be on the board at Promo Kitchen and love working with these uh, uh, folks in the industry that are now carrying the torch and bringing it to new heights. Well, I'm glad to hear kind of the origin story for that because it came from a place of true meaning, genuine, yep. like, hey, let's fill this void and let's, let's give education, let's give mentorship to people. Because the industry, as you said, it's not a not necessarily a, a bad reflection. It's just kind of where the industry was at the time. Yeah. Um, let's talk about SKUCon. So we have talked about it. Um, Seth Godin, who I said we'll talk about later, uh, yeah. he's going to be you know keynoting for you guys. I want to talk about the event as itself because it traditionally is an in-person event. It gets rave reviews for being different. And I think I can say uh, accurately here, the fact that you have Elizabeth, who was kind of you know just stirred up the pot um, yeah. of promo as a speaker, I think that that's a testament to like, hey, we want to have open ideas. We want to have, you know, dialogue and, you know, innovation and disruption. Talk about the event. And then secondarily, talk about this year's event, which is going to be virtual. Yeah, th thank you for asking that. So we uh, have, have at Common Skew have felt very, very strongly about the power of events to educate, inspire, and connect the people who use the common SKU software platform. Um, and that goes right back to the, the earlier comment that I was making about the power of the social platform, the power of yeah. the community that common SKU represents. Um, and about five, six years ago, we had this idea to create this in-person version of our community, which was largely virtual because we have customers that are all across the world and uh, on a daily basis, they're not seeing each other. So right. could, we, could we create this, this opportunity to bring them together? Um, so we did that uh, in 2015. We brought together people in person and it was an absolutely electric environment. Um, we had uh, uh, industry speakers that were speaking from about their experiences of failures and success and what they had done and then shared lessons from their journey. And, and it, was, it was obviously a great party and just a, a great amount of inspiration and connection. And that really kickstarted this great tradition of events at Common SKU. We've run SKUCon now for over what, uh, I think we're on 
event number eight now with SKUCon. Okay. We've had a number of other offshoot events that where we've brought people together in different formats, and that's been really, really fun as well. Um, but it was very sad for us, I'll tell you, Joshua, that uh, we had our last in-person SKUCon in January of 2020, and it was in Las Vegas. It was a huge sold-out affair, and no one in that room had any idea of what they were about to experience right. when they <laughs> flew home, or flo or, sorry, flew home, and then you know experienced this whole shutdown. Uh, you know, a, literally a few weeks later. Right. Um, so I was saying that we were sad that that was the last time we had it in person, but we recognized that there was still an opportunity to to bring the community together, to sure. educate, inspire, and connect them. And we wanted to lean into technology. We're a technology company ourselves, yeah. so we're not, we're not strangers to that. So we looked at different ways that we could host a virtual SKUCon. Um, and that's what's happening on January 7th. Uh, the event uh, is, it, we're overwhelmed by the response and the number of registrations already. And the event's not, is about six weeks away. Okay. Um, and so that speaks, I think, to the, the, our customers desire to be connected yeah. and, and to, to feel like they're, they belong to something and uh, we're honored to play a role in that. Um, and then I think to your, your final point of your question, uh, we're incredibly humbled and honored to be able to welcome Seth. Uh, Seth Godin has been a business idol of mine for over 10 years. I've read all of his books. He's had a massive impact on how it is that I see the business world and a lot of his teachings have been woven into what we've done in both of my businesses. And um, uh, he, he uh, is a very busy person and <laughs> I agreed to this speaking engagement and uh, we're really excited about it. Uh, I've developed a relationship with him over the last 10, 15 years. Just I've reached out to him. I've communicated with him. I've shared ideas. And so we've got to know each other. And, uh, and, and so I'm humbled by that friendship and humbled by the fact that he's going to be one of our keynotes uh, at the event, in addition to all of these other incredible people in the industry. So it's a, it's a real honor for us to host this. Well, congratulations. That's uh, definitely an exciting uh, event to be looking forward to. Um, yeah, and I'm you. with you. My last event was February 22nd. Oh. I got on a plane on the 23rd and shortly thereafter, things changed uh, really quickly. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's good to see how the, the industry has adapted um, yeah. from virtual conferences and some have been good and some have been bad. Um, but we know that there will be some hybrid environment of that moving yeah. forward. Definitely cannot wait to get back on a plane and be in person with people because you just can't, you can't replace that. It, there's yep. just something that's priceless. Um, I want to talk about your podcast. So you guys have done well over 100 episodes of the podcast. Um, I'd like to just talk about, was this just another extension, uh, another you know, channel for you guys to share education? Um, having do, done the show for the past six months, uh, I know that it's not necessarily as easy as I thought it would be at the beginning. Um, uh, talk about your journey from the <laughs> beginning and what you've learned along the way. Uh, so content and education, in, in my view, have always gone hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, and so we developed a content strategy from almost the very beginning of common skew because it was a way for us to indulge our curiosities it was our way to share the experiences that uh, we had as practitioners in the promotional mm -hmm. products industry so going back to my right sleeve days and and saw it as a natural way of being able to inspire the the customer base and and educate the customer base and for me just as someone in business i just felt like that was a great authentic way of running a business. Sure. Inspire your customers, educate your customers. They're going to stick with you. They're going to, they're going to evangelize for you. Yeah. They're going to be successful. You're going to be successful. So what a great uh, infinite loop, so to speak. Yeah, right. Um, so specifically with regard to the podcast, uh, I think that the, the podcast, it was a, a fun new medium. Uh, it was blowing up in terms of the uh, the number of people that were listening to podcasts, particularly yeah. some of our younger customers, a new way to indulge or, or to um, consume content. Mm -hmm. And so we just jumped right in. Um, Bobby Lehu, our chief content officer, and I, who have uh, uh, co-hosted the podcast over the years, 
also had experience in having a podcast through Promo Kitchen. And okay. the Promo Kitchen podcast still exists to this day and okay. very proud of that as well. So we had a little bit of experience in having, in, in having experimented in this medium sure. before. And it has been an absolute labor of love. Okay. Um, we don't make money from our podcast. We don't have sponsorship for the podcast. We don't have a, a sponsorship for any of our content. Um, so it is truly a labor of love because we know that A, we're the ones who are learning just as much as our audience because we're yeah. speaking to these incredibly smart and inspiring people. Right. And it's it's been such an honor to do it. And I, I tell you, if if you had said would you still be doing a podcast uh, four or so years later after launching it? I would have said, probably not. And, and, and I feel honestly that we're literally just getting started. And okay. uh, so it's, it's been a wonderful medium. And I would say for anyone who's considering the medium that, uh, sure, it's a lot of work. But I think that if you go into this uh, uh, um, and, and you do it from a, a, a good place and a place of authenticity, yep. uh, much like how you're doing here, Joshua, you're doing a fantastic job with your podcast. You can yep. tell it's so authentic and, and you're indulging your passions, that that enthusiasm will carry forward to your listeners and listeners right. go, this is great. And then they'll share it. And then it just becomes a great engagement medium, yeah. um, which is which is great for you personally. And I also think professionally. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, I've gotten far more out of this personally than I thought. Um, yeah. And when we started this, I think we thought we'd do 10 episodes. Yeah. Um, but no, this is this has become a long term strategy of the business. Yeah. Um, I do want to talk about just the your observations, because I do. I've hated content. I've been in marketing for over 15 years. And I, I hate the word content, like I cringe yeah. every time I heard it. And it honestly wasn't until I found this medium where it just clicked. And I was like, okay, um, but we have had speed bumps. So I'm just curious, any entrepreneur that is looking at starting it, what recommendations do you have that might grease the wheels to get them through some of those early speed bumps and kind of get into the rhythm where you and I are both at now? I think, I think first of all, it's really important for anyone who's wanting to start a podcast is to why it is that they're doing it. Is it, is it a personal project? Is it a professional project? Um, what business objectives are you trying to satisfy by doing this? Okay. Um, and, I, and I think that that's fairly, that, that's maybe one part of my advice. And I think that's fairly straightforward. And a lot of people sure. may say, well, that's common sense, but I'm actually surprised by the number of people I speak to that actually have not answered those questions. Right. Their answer is literally, well, podcasts are popular. Podcasts are cool. So I should do a podcast. Right. And then I say, well, uh, you realize this is going to be very time consuming. Like like what does success look like for you? And if they can't answer yeah. that question, more often than not, it'll be a failure or they'll just lose interest. Right. Um, because it takes a while to get to build up a listenership, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're doing 20 episodes, you might have your mom and dad listening to it for the first 20 episodes, and that's <laughs> going to be frustrating. Right. Um, so, so I think that if you have those objectives really clearly articulated, then that's going to power you through that desert that you'll likely yeah. experience at the very beginning. Um, and then I think after that, um, understanding the format of the show. Some people will want to do interview style shows like what you're doing right now. Sure. And those are very popular because you can tie into a, a professional network of people to in, engage as guests. Yeah. And you can have a very engaging conversation where the output is, is valuable to the listener. Right. Um, some people want to get a little bit more artistic and do a narrative podcasting uh, style like reply all or this American life. Like these right. are other examples. They take a little bit more time and effort, but some people do a very good job of those. Yeah. Um, so, but I think that the easiest advice that I would give if any of this is sounding complex is just do it. Just, <laughs> just, just do it, record it. It'll be awful at first. <laughs> and then you're going to get better. If I listen right. to the first skew cast that we did or the first promo kitchen podcast that we did, I cringe at listening to how annoying my voice was, how inarticulate I was, how, how the listener or my guest must've been thinking what a loser this interviewer is. <laughs> you know what? That's just the way it is. You just get better. So right. stick with it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad you said it's uh, it's my favorite uh, corporate slogan. Just do it. Um, yeah. I don't care yeah, what yeah, you're yeah, doing. Of course. Do, 
do something and just grow and learn from it. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, you're just going to be sitting on the sidelines thinking about it. Yeah. And you're not making any progress. Well, um, and you're in the hometown of Nike there. So there you go. Exactly. You got to gotta represent. <laughs> yeah. um, is there anything else that we haven't covered that you think is topical right now, whether it's something that you guys are doing as a business um, or just something that you guys are seeing in the industry? You talked about this concept of hybrid and uh, being able to bring the in-person with virtual. And I think that that's, I think it's an interesting topic for discussion because okay. up until this point, pre-pandemic, I think the concept of virtual was very much looked down upon. I think people looked at virtual as, oh, yet another boring webinar. 100%. And, and in, in many respects, you would have been, been absolutely right to roll your eyes at yet another boring webinar. Yeah. We don't need another boring webinar, but that's really what virtual represented yeah. um, because everything was on premise mm -hmm. and for good reason. On premise is fantastic. Um, I think what's very interesting and I think very exciting for anyone who's in the content world or anyone who's in the marketing world is that I really believe hybrid is our new reality. Because yeah. what we've learned as people that have put on a number of in-person events, as well as an organization that's put on a number of virtual events, mm -hmm. that each of them cater to a different audience. Um, there are different economics behind each. Um, your ability to engage a global audience at a very low cost virtually is incredibly easy. And whereas your ability to engage a large global audience at a low cost in person is very, very difficult, if not impossible, because right. you've got travel costs, you've got people that are out of their office, you've got a time commitment, and then you've got all these expenses in producing an, uh, an in-person conference. So I I think the smart marketer and smart content person of tomorrow is someone that will be able to lean into both. And now that virtual, uh, now that we've experienced virtual during the pandemic, and, and I think the jury feels that virtual isn't all that bad. It's not the boring webinar. It's yeah. a lot more engaging than we thought that I think the marketer of tomorrow has got another, um, what is it? An, a, a arrow, an arrow in their quiver. Yeah, an arrow in their quiver. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, more eloquent than me. That that I think that that's very very exciting. And, and we speak from experience. We think about producing this virtual SKUCon. The economics and the number of people that we're able to attract to this event blow our in person event out of the water. Simply yeah. because there's unlimited inventory. Right. You don't have to worry about charging to cover your food and beverage costs and your AV costs and all these yeah. things that you don't have to spend. So you can drive savings to the attendee. Um, and I think, I think that's incredibly exciting um, in terms of how content people can engage their customers and their audience over the next, you know, 10 years. Well, I love it and I feel it. I'm going to take it one step further, but I, because I do feel it from you and having heard the reviews and watch, you know, clips of your past conferences, I think the main takeaway to, in order to be effective with it is to really put yourself in the seat of the listener or yep. the attendee and make sure it's not just another, right? It, there's some level of engagement. There's dynamic, like that you have yeah. to have it because, because you can reach a broader audience, but you can also lose an audience like that yes. if they're just not engaged with what it is that you're producing. That, that is true. The, the, the competition for your uh, listener or your attendee's attention yeah. is insane. Right. It, uh, we all know this. I mean, you and I have probably attended... Uh, three virtual events in the last week. Uh, and think about all the things that you've got going with you, the 28 tabs you have on your browser. And, um, but virtual events that do a good job of, of engaging your attention yes. can get it and it can be yes. very effective. The ones that drone on and are kind of like that boring webinar, you know, we've all been there. Well, then you're on your phone. And, yeah. and that, that's a bit of a shame. But again, as an attendee, if you haven't flown to Las Vegas to be at a conference, well, now it's no big deal for you just to work on your email on the side. So, right. so there is a downside to virtual for sure. And I think we, as content producers, have to work extra hard yeah. to, to engage that audience, to, to make sure they walk away and get value. Well said. Um, well, Mark, I want to thank you for coming on. Um, I actually look forward to having you back. Uh, I'd love to, to regroup after uh, SKUCon and, uh, and hear how the event went. 
Yeah, well, this has been a, a real honor. Uh, always uh, the, the conversations that go by the quickest are always the most fun. So uh, thank you so much. Congratulations on this amazing podcast. And uh, thank you for the honor of having me here. Thank you.